Welcome, everyone. It's great to see such a nice crowd on such a beautiful evening. And I'm really thrilled and honored to be here with Mika and Paul. I learned yesterday that they have never met before. So uh, we sort of started a conversation last night, and we will continue it in public. I feel that I am the third wheel. I don't really need to be here. I saw last night that they could just talk all night. And I'm going to try to maybe prompt some subjects and interrupt if I need to, if we need to move on to something else. But I know that they will uh, you know, have a lot to say. So congratulations to you both on your incredible exhibitions. Mika, it's you know, amazing that you really haven't shown your work in Los Angeles. And I think um, for someone who started my career in New York, you know, Mika's work was very visible in the early days of my career in the early 2000s. So, um, it's wonderful to see it here and to share it with audiences here. Paul needs no introduction, obviously, to LA audiences, an icon, I think we could say. You know, last night we talked about the fact that I could just throw out words and then they could riff on those words. There's a lot that their work has in common and a lot of ways that it's quite different. And I think we'll unpack both of those things. But I thought I would start with a, a light subject, global domination and see if you could each just maybe say a few words about how global domination operates in your work in some form or another. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> global domination. Um, uh, I mean, I think the subject of um, Domination and fascism and uh, institutional uh, systemized repression is, is been a subject for my work for a long time. I think uh, I, I think it it begins maybe with just simple institutional institutions of education and uh, uh, institutional architecture and um, and then the male figure and the male uh, aggression I guess um, so um, and I, and I think it came up again, you know, in my work. It came up for me in a, in a very concrete way in the 60s with uh, reading Wilhelm Reich. And uh, of course it starts shooting off from there, but uh, the discovery of Wilhelm Reich in the 60s was uh, like some sort of eye-opener, like, uh, what the fuck are we in? And uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, so <clears throat> it's just, it's a subject. And uh, I, I made, I've been making work now for about four years about Adolf Hitler as, an, as a, a male icon or an archetype of some sort. And I was making the work with uh, Lilla Stangenberg, uh, who's German, and uh, she, as Ava Braun. But uh, in the last two years, Ava Braun turned to Marilyn Monroe. So we saw it as uh, archetypes of a male-female, the male and the female. I don't know, that's enough maybe. <laughs> that's great. I was just relaxing. <laughs> he was settling in for the story. Um, no, it's interesting because yesterday when we spoke, and, and I, I feel like, you know, I've been a fan for years. Um, so, and there's many kind of inspiration or maybe common uh, interests, but I think the architecture, this uh, institutional, architecture, the way that we are kind of um, set in these spaces and trying to like infiltrate and kind of fuck them up or kind of um, borrow these um, 
spaces in a way. And then, like with your work, the, the photos that we looked at yesterday, it was like the, the you know, the formica on the walls and that, that kind of the, the, the palette of these like institutional spaces mm -hmm. with, you know, the body and the margarine or whatever is going on. And that really, I felt like I saw that connection. Yeah. Of, um, trying to kind of negate power in a way by infiltrating into these um, spaces, mm -hmm. using them in a way. So, um, yeah, global domination is a, is a big one. <laughs> we can get into globalization and commodification in a minute. Let's stick with architecture for a minute. Because as you're pointing out, Mika, it's, it's so important to both of your work. And, you know, in some sense, it is almost a character in, in the videos. It struck me that in your work, Mika, the, the architecture almost becomes like the interior of the body, the kind of passageways and the movement and the, the disorientation, I think, is in both of the work. Paul, for in your work, it, it's like the architecture is it's the id space. It's it's very very loaded psychologically. Um, we talked a little bit yesterday about you know architecture as a sort of trap or a dead end. You know, thinking about the bunker, thinking about the spaces, you know, one atop another, and how they invert sometimes. Do you each want to talk about? how you approach architecture. I'm also curious about the production. You're, you're both building spaces in the studio and then shooting in them. So maybe walk us through the making a little bit, but also why that architectural space is so important to the work. I mean, I wonder, because for me, I think that the architecture is always an extension of the person. I, I think there's like this blending between interior space and exterior space. They're all kind of the same. Um, so, yeah, I'm wondering if, if how do you how do you see the spaces and and the protagonist within them? Are they the same, or the spaces kind of like an extension of, of the body, or, or or do they how do they exist in the space? Uh, I mean, lately, I I mean, for a long time, I've thought of the architecture spaces as traps it, and but also I, I refer to them often as skulls mm -hmm. that it that the set is a skull and that you ex the, the thing that goes on in the set often like I think with television studios they're always shaped like a U, like the television studio, the, the sitcom or the news program is a U. And it's open at one end for the camera. And I've, I've always put sets so they're enclosed. And the, so you're, you're caught in them. And it was interesting that often they had swinging doors. So there was a connection to body, to womb, to skull, and, I, and the windows become eyes. And what goes on inside is a dream or a nightmare. So uh, the architecture is definitely body related. Um, uh, but um, also the idea of a trap is the idea that we can't leave the earth. We're stuck as human beings and uh, we exist in a trap. You know? Mika, can you talk a little more about how you create the sets and, and how you think of the is the architecture the body for you? I mean, there's literally almost like intestinal tubes running through certain mm. spaces. A lot of materiality kind of moving through those orifices in some sense. Yeah, again, I, I see it as like all the kind of pictorial surface. So there's no, 
this maybe there's not so much hierarchy because it's a psychological space so yeah. there's no hierarchy between the um, the activator of the space and the space itself is it's an extension so it's kind of like this magical world where they're all like your mind kind of affects what you see around you and the space around you um so so there's that and the thing that the, the like, like the institutional aesthetics is something that i kind of repeat i I'm like obviously i have a thing with it um and you know these corridors these the way that spaces are divided and how we're meant to behave in them um, and what does it mean to misbehave in them um, and yeah I've always been interested in, in spaces maybe because I'm so disoriented always like space is such a mystery to me like I never really fully understand it and I, I, I feel like also I really my mind affects the way that the space is around me so it's always maybe their maps like a way to find my own um, personhood my own understanding of, of uh, my um, of p the position of the subject space they're always uh, maybe like a kind of a mapping mm. on of that um, yeah and the sets I mean there are always loved making sets, like creating these spaces that are they're sculptural. I think yesterday we talked a lot about, like this always comes down to to sculpture, but not as like a object, as, as a thing that, I mean, we all exist in these constructed spaces. So it's really interesting to construct a space that doesn't have a use, that, that is an art space, never an installation. It's, not a film set because a film set will like serve the story. So it just it just serves itself. It just kind of examines this phenomena of like behaving in a space or misbehaving in a, in a space and and this idea of the trap. Like there's always these doors and you're always like, okay, how do I get out of here? Like you can never leave, kind of thing. It's interesting, Paul. You 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 said they're like a nightmare or a dream because it, they do have that quality in both of your work. These are very familiar spaces. They have a kind of vernacular, familiar architecture, but you're completely disoriented. You, you can't figure out in watching. In the course of the videos, you never really reveal what the space is and holistically that we're in. We just keep getting kind of you know moved around and sort of backed into corners or trapped. So it, it remains very mysterious. Yeah, I think we talked yesterday about the, because I always, feel like I don't want to show the set or the space yeah. and yeah. I think in Paul's case you show it and it's it's, maybe it's less disorienting or something but I, I I like to create these spaces that can only exist as uh, as an as illusion you know as a film mm -hmm. um, so it would be kind of revealing the illusion if I would just show them yeah like that yeah uh, but in Paul's case it's like also the aftermath too. It's like like the evidence of something would happen. Yeah, your sets become like a forensic crime scene or something. A what? <laughs> a forensic crime scene for us to kind of try to have some understanding of what has occurred here. I mean, I think, you know, for the most part in the last, what? five or six years, maybe more, the sets I've built are in the studio and yeah. they're set up and some the pieces happen and everything is left as when the, you know, like if it's a film and we shoot for 30 or 40 days or whatever, then the doors are just shut and they're, it's lo they're locked up. And <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, it's not that people don't go in them again at times, but they're just sealed up. And then they sit in the studio, uh, kind of like carcasses. And yeah, time at, capsule. At this point, they're, you know, they're not seen. They just exist in the studio. I was, it, but also in the last few years, I'm, I'm not... I, I don't think I'm actively making sets anymore. It, uh, I'm, you know, 
Adolf and Ava, when we shot that, we shot it in nature, so outside. Yeah. And then we we filmed again in Norway in a bomb shelter. So it becomes it's becoming more about locations mm -hmm. and found places as opposed to making sets. Mm -hmm. It seems like that that's changed in the last uh, few years. So um, I, I don't see. I don't know whether I make sets anymore. You know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll have. To, oh, we'll just wait and see what happens. But lately, it's been about locations and not about making an object. And Mika, in your most recent film, I mean, it's 2019 now, right? But you were also shooting in locations, and then and then yeah, in all of them. I mean, well. I prefer to use ready-mades if they're if they're there. Like, why why build it? Um, oh, I kind of I started by building sets because I. I couldn't, like I was limited of uh, going to places where these spaces kind of exist. Um, but I always wanted to, to break out, to mix it mm -hmm. together. Like to make, there's always this idea of like this synthetic continuity to make my own space and then to have a hole and go out to the world and, and to, to kind of bring it in. Yeah. And, and why, why, I don't know. But I, I, I'd prefer not to make anything if it exists already. Mm -hmm. um, or just to kind of slightly alter it. Um, make it a little see. more surreal, a little stranger. Yeah, I mean, the world is a pretty strange place <laughs> right now. So I don't sure. feel like I'm... So, and existing within it is, is, uh, is pretty strange. Um, so when those two things, again, like the psychological and like the social, like the, these constructed spaces that are constructed for a function and then these like art dysfunctional spaces, um, it's interesting to see how they could, they could work together and also production of, of objects because as an artist you also make objects. So I'm interested in this place of like useless object or dysfunctional objects. Um, which most of things are kind of are, you know, even if they have a function, and kind of mi mixing that um, with that. So thinking about everything as like these like weird dysfunctional objects that you know, exist out there and making them into um, sculpture. So um, in, in, with both of your work, I keep having this phrase kind of pop into my head, the banality of spectacle. But then I kind of reversed it and I was thinking the spectacle of banality. It's almost like it could be either. But could you each talk a little bit about how you think of the banal, even extending to the idea of the absurd, but how you think of whether the, the sort of exaggeration and spectacle that you weave into those kind of banal spaces and you know, just the relationship between those two things. <laughs> <laughs> I can talk okay. about the banal if you need a moment. I can, I don't know, I can. The I banal, can. I mean, um, I mean it, it, what, the, the, the banal of everyday living, is that what you're referring Yeah, the banal of everyday living and the, you know, um, I don't know, maybe I can explain something. I, I have to do a theater piece in Germany and I was gonna build a set and I already had a set that was my, I rebuilt my, the house I grew up in as a set. It's, a, it's somewhat exaggerated, the living room's a little bigger. It was built two parts, one part, was the outside, which was three-quarter scale. So it's smaller than the house, and it's the outside. But it's, it's still... Snow White set, huh? Paul? Yeah, in the yeah, White set. That. And then the outside, the inside, was close to the same dimension, but a little uh, 
uh, the living room was two or three feet longer. The dining room was two or three feet longer. The bathroom was exactly the same. The kitchen, the same. The hallway was extended about five feet. Um, and I, I did it, I, I grew up, I li my bedroom was in the basement with no windows. And I built that as a, as a separate set and then built the upstairs, I built one part, it was three sets. One was the four sets, one to the outside, three quarters. The other was the main floor, slightly exaggerated in points. The third set was where the basement that I grew up in and the staircase going up to the second floor, which was the other floor. <laughs> and both my parents died in the bathroom. They both had strokes in the bathroom on July the 4th, uh, 10 years apart. So the bathroom, I spent a lot of time trying to make exactly the same. But, <clears throat> and the set, the whole set, the white snow set, which is, you know, quite large, sat in my studio for the last almost nine years, I guess. And so when I went to do the piece in Germany, I was going to build a set, then I decided I would use the set from my parents' house, so I shipped the kitchen, the hallway, and the bathroom to Germany. And then when I did White Snow, uh, there was a connection. I always thought my, my mother had a resemblance to Snow White. And uh, my father is the same age as Walt Disney, dressed very similar. So there was a thing of playing Walt Disney and Snow White in my house had a reference. There was a thing of pulling up my parents into these two characters. And, uh, but now uh, we put the set on the stage and uh, Adolf Hitler and Marilyn Monroe are now in the set. So there's something about taking the everyday and using that as the context. But of course the everyday is connected in a deep way to me internally and psychologically. So, right. you know, it, questions what the everyday is, what the mundane is. And is the house mundane? Is it the everyday? And then the spectacle, of course, is Adolf Hitler and Marilyn Monroe pretending. Of course, I, in this piece, she refers to me as, I, I don't speak German very well, so I'm a dumb fucking American. And uh, I'm an old fucking prick, and a uh, limp prick. And uh, she refers to me as a fucking artist and uh, in a fucking gallery. And uh, I refer to her as a fucking actress and a German whore. So we play the parts of ourselves and we play the parts, like we're not, we're not trying to be, I'm not trying to be Adolf Hitler, although I'm trying to be a tyrant, but I, I'm more of a buffoon than a tyrant, you know, so, uh, so I don't know, I, I think that's a mix of, of the everyday with the spectacle. And then it's in a spectacle, like these theaters are architectural. I mean, there's 
you know, all the ornamentation and it's something from another age. And then of course, they do this thing where they divide the stage and the audience is on one side and the performance is on the other and there's a line and you can't cross the line, literally. You can't, it's like moving the performance into the audience became really difficult because they have a firewall. It's all about building and safety. Like it came down to building and safety, created this separation. And of course it's a rectangle. And then it just becomes like a, 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 some sort of relief painting in which you, the audience stays back. It's, um, and it sits in a spectacle of a sort but it's a controlled and very repressive situation. It doesn't allow for, it, it's, it's only about a view into something that doesn't come at you. Like one of the, when you were talking about the surround, I was thinking, yeah, I, I've always been in, interested in immersive spaces. Like somebody would say, well, why is the piece so big? Well. We live in immersive environments that all surround us. And uh, that's what it's, you know, painting is like something in front, drawings is something in front, but we exist in immersive environments. And why wouldn't I want to represent that if I was trying to talk about the world I live in? And uh, so there's something about, you know, when you were talking, I was like, yeah, it's why wouldn't I want to make this? It's kind of like, how do I talk about this without making this, you know? I want to come back to some of what you said because there was a lot to unpack there. But Mika, do you want to add anything? <clears throat> um, well, I guess about the banal, I guess it's, it's always been, I feel like that's where an, those moments happen. Like it's not in the spectacle. It's in um, these like everyday moments. You know, it's like one like little piece that I have, and I keep repeating it. It is this like steam. You know, it's like tss, tss, and then the way that kind of every time it like would evaporate in a different way. So it's like collaborating with the forces and trying to like remake these sculpture, and each time is different. And that's like super banal, you know, you like cook something and then you like just trip out on the, the way that the steam is, you know, which is like super banal and super um, spectacle. Beautiful. So yeah, I mean, for me, it's never like the spectacle. If someone shows me something, I, I'm, I always just kind of, I, I look at the, like the dirty floor, like under or something. It's always like in the back end um, where, you know, these like unintentional things happen, which is more like air for unintentional things to happen or like less of a controlled space. Um, so there's something maybe about the banal that because it's like neglected, it's like these institutional spaces, they're like non-spaces, like nobody ever gives them too much care and it's all these generic spaces. So um, because they kind of belong to nobody, these other things can enter. I don't know. These other forces kind of could take perhaps over. take over. And these, um, yeah, it's a lot more interesting, again, to trip out on like the little floor or the steam than, than to see, I don't know, for me <laughs> at least, to, to, to see this big kind of spectacle. So, so, because I guess it's like a psychological space back to that. It's not about where you are, it's what it activates in you. So that's why when we're talking about spaces, I'm trying more and more to, to perhaps create these spaces internally. Um, so, so it's what something activates in you that makes it uh, immersive in, in a way. And um, yeah, and that could be you are in a space and it moves, and, it, and, and it, but it could also be there's nothing in the room. You know, and that activates something that is so, so it's always about like the reaction to the space rather than in the space. Do you, do you, are you very attracted to the commodities that 
you are portraying in the work? Is there a kind of beauty to all those objects? You know, I'm not a big object person, really. Like, it's really about everything around the objects that I'm interested in. Um, that's why I make mostly videos, because I feel like, what do you do with objects? Or like, they just, like, they take space and, and, um, and you lose, I don't know, I lose stuff. So it's like, I don't, I'm not that kind of fascination with the object. I don't know, I never had it, but I'm fascinated by the processes around the object. Like what makes an object suddenly, you know, from a pile of trash become this like something that's worth millions of dollars. Like that, that moment of like, what are the forces that are there? And of course you can't, you can't, if someone could have completely figure it out, then like, good for that. Some people could figure it out, but how that, that happens, you know, you can't, once you figure it out, then it's no longer valid. Like you have to reinvent like that. What makes something suddenly be like worth something culturally or, or money or whatever. So I'm way more interested in the processes than the, than the objects themselves. And, and the materiality, right? I mean, it feels like, in the, in the videos, you're really experimenting with the formal qualities of those materials. You're yeah. melting them, you're smashing I think it's them. always been like what it activates, again, what it activates in you. That's why ASMR is such a cool thing. And I've been trying to do oh, yeah. ASMR in like the, ASMR? the late 90s, and then I never understood like what it was until, you know, all these kids are doing it like a million times better than me on YouTube. Can you explain <laughs> it? Does anyone um, understand this? I don't. I don't know exactly, I forget the words, but it's these phenomena, the visual phenomena, tactile phenomena that activate something in, in your brain. It's like a brain massage or something. So you could see some, someone like- So there's like, a lot of pleasure. Pleasure or activation of like electric forces in your brain or something. Um, and a lot of the times it comes from the digital space. So it's something you see and that it like activates something in you. And it, it's a lot of like the sound, like the crickling sound of say like fat, like butter or something being smushed or, or like something melting, this like all these, all these things. Um, and I've been interested in that in, in video for forever. And then it just caught up like in, uh, in this crazy way and it's been really perfected. So that's really cool to, to see. Well, let, oh. Are we gonna, okay, I have a lot more questions. Um, I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna ask one more question, then I'm gonna turn it over to all of you. I think we have to talk about noses and prosthetics, which is, features prominently in both of your yeah. works. Do you wanna talk a little bit about your attraction to the nose? <laughs> I, I actually, Paul, I don't know if you'll remember this, but I have a very fond memory of coming to your studio when you were doing Snow White, White Snow with a bunch of people from The Hammer, Annie and Aram and Connie and me. And when Paul came to the door, he was still dressed as Walt Disney. So he had the, the no and the nose of course was the most, you know, signifying aspect of his costume. And we did the entire studio visit for about two hours. And he, he was, you weren't in character, you were being Paul, but you were dressed as Walt Disney. It was very um, disturbing in a way. And he just stayed in costume the whole time. So, noses, prosthetics, <laughs> sneezing. So, I don't know, you have sneezing? I don't know, it's more the snot than the sneezing, but the nose is... Body fluids. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, you talked about male domination and all that. I feel like my spaces don't, there is, it's like, there's not that much, that many men in, in my work. Um, there's something like, there's not much like phallic objects. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of holes and panels and, and all that somehow that happens and but the nose maybe is like this phallic thing it's like this thing that like protrudes out um and <laughs> could grow you know perhaps at least in your mind um so the fear of it growing yeah yeah but the no i mean yeah <laughs> noses are any thoughts on noses uh <laughs> Well, I, you know, at one point I was, I used masks, and then the masks turned to noses. So it was a kind of disguise, but I, it, 
the mask, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a lot about masks that have to do with uh, how they affect how they affect you when you wear them. And does it affect you in, in the sense of becoming a character? And I, I think so. But I, I noticed in the, the the first performances I did in the well, maybe not the first, but by the time of nineteen. 69 or something, uh, the first thing I did was tape up my head and, and taped my face. And so there was something about covering the face. And uh, that was a part of performances for a number of years was this thing of covering the face and also covering the eyes. Um, in a way, trying to close off the world in a way. And I used to think that masks, in a sense, were an architecture because they affect the sound. Like when you talk, the sound is louder in your ears. And so there were things about a mask, but you know, at some point I wasn't interested in masks anymore. It just seemed to fade away, but uh, things fade away. And then, Noses became a, a way of of creating a, a disguise in a way, but also my nose didn't look like Walt Disney's nose. So, <laughs> and um, my nose doesn't look anything like Adolf Hitler's nose, and um, I, or you know uh, other characters I've played, uh, J.P. Morgan or. Mm -hmm. whatever, but a Trump, mm -hmm. you know, a Trump nose, you know. So the nose became a way, but it's also, is, it is a phallic. And there's something about the phallic of the nose, right? And so it was, it, it became in a certain way a buffoon. Mm -hmm. If I made it big, it's like the buffoon, like, to make the male another a type of buffoon, right? And um, so, you know, uh, yeah, it's there. I mean, in terms of prosthetics, I mean, uh, arms and legs and and uh, and I, I was thinking, you know, when we were talking before about sets. You know, within the film, within a certain, you know, uh, cliche of filmmaking, I don't know whether it's a cliche, but it's the set becomes a throwaway, right? And the prosthetic is a throwaway. And then my, I don't think of them as uh, relics which is a term that was used a lot by 70 artists to describe something that happened after the performance. I don't think of them as relics. I think of them as a sculpture that's been acted on. Right. And um, so it, it's an, an intention of being in character to make an object. like. It, you know, the, the thing with the drawing show that's up right now, I mean, I think, I don't know, uh, we've made, Lilith and I have made like uh, 30 or 40 of the big drawings. And, uh, um, but it's really, and they're not really in character in the sense of, okay, I'm gonna draw as Adolf Hitler. It's not that. And she's not going, oh, I'm going to be Ava Braun. But the drawings are separate from the performance and they operate differently. Like the drawings become, you know, it's about making a drawing in some sort of state of mind. But uh, I think there's something about making work in a state of mind and creating an altered state to make work, to be in an altered state. So, uh, and that's a method. Yeah. 
And um, so, yeah, it's about, yeah, altered states. That's great, thank you. Alex, do you want to take questions? Do we have any questions? Oh. Hi. Thank you very much. That was really good. Um, a few questions. You spoke about the earth being a trap. How did you, the earth being a trap, how did you figure that out? And do you see the trap continuing after death? And is your work part of an escape plan? I, I didn't hear the last part. Is your work part of an escape plan? Oh. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, I think so. They did, you go, you go somewhere else. Temporary escape. Next question. Um, thank you very much. This is um, for Mika. Um, I find your work to be very optimistic, and I was wondering if that's intentional or if you consider yourself to be an optimist. <laughs> oh, that's nice. <clears throat> um, I think there is something optimistic about it. I hope, um, yeah, I think there's something about, maybe it's like, okay, this like, spirit about it that, that I, um, I mean, it's finding these moments in these places that are, could be really harsh. Um, and maybe it's about the banal too. It's like finding that like one moment that, just feels original or feels um, like super present, you know? Um, that thing of presence, I think, is something that I'm really, like finding that moment, like that materiality, like, like going to where like the electrons, you know, and the particles, like everything is made out of these like vibrating like matter. Um, so I think there's always kind of searching for that vibrant matter and, um, a lot of the time, I mean, it could be anywhere because it's all, it's everywhere. It's like we're all, you know, part of it. So I think in that sense, there is um, kind of an optimistic kind of uh, galactic thing about, about it. Um, within, inside, you know, like you're like stuck in a jail cell and then you're like just looking at like the sunset from, you know, Whatever. So, so maybe there is kind of trying to, like, talking about being trapped, and we talked about being trapped, um, is to, like, the way out is, like, from within. Sorry, it sounds like so. <laughs> but um, kind of finding that way out, rather than out there in the spectacle, but finding it through these, like, portals that are more, like, internal. Um, this, like, infinity portals. Um, so, First of all, it's an honor to speak with both of you, since I really admire both of your work a lot. But Can you see I, that? Oh, sorry. I was wondering if you could talk about, um, for each of you to mention, like, a revelatory moment for you, whether it was recent or when you were young, that you were mm. in a space and you felt, like, the banality or the quotidian things in life really like, amazed you, even if, if it was a peculiar moment or something that triggered inspiration for a film, I'd be interested to hear. Could you hear that? I, I don't know. One thing I can think about is I keep, I don't know what I have today with like uh, the floors or ceiling. I always like floor and ceilings, but I remember my grandma's, maybe because you talked about your parents' house, my grandma's tiles, these like 70s like stone tiles and finding, you know, it's like the clouds, like finding endless shapes, you know, and there's just like little stones kind of cut together and each one is like, so maybe that's the moment where it's like, oh my God, like so much 
like a whole world um, open in this like um, floor space. Um, and the cracks in the floor and like, you know, these little, like trying to kind of dig little portals um, in it. So maybe that was a moment, I don't know, when I was five. <laughs> I don't know. Do you have a Did moment? Did you hear the question, that? Paul? I, what? Did you hear the question? I couldn't hear the question at all. <laughs> he was asking if there's a moment in your memory that where um, something kind of banal or quotidian sort of inspired you. Was that the question? I think so, yeah. A, a spatial kind of revelation. I mean, I, I, you know, I think things happen between a consciousness and a subconscious of some sort. So how I'm affected by everyday life seems to be both in some way a conscious thing and a subconscious thing. So how things turn out or why they go the direction they go, I don't always, it's kind of somewhere between controlling it and knowing what it is and not controlling it and not knowing what it is. So, yeah, I'm sure I'm affected by things, yeah. Yeah. One more question, maybe? Two more questions. Two more questions. One? No more, no questions. more questions. I'll let you wrap it up, Anne. What? I'll let you wrap it up. Okay, no more questions? Okay. All right, thank you all so much for coming.